It's a kind of introduction to, a, well, quite a few sessions that we'll be having over the day devoted to research infrastructures. And the title of the plenary, as you can see in your uh, programs, is Research Infrastructures and the Making of a European Research Area. I'm very pleased that uh, uh, I have the three speakers here with me who each in their own right have contributed, I would say, uh, uh, substantial energy, knowledge, and what have you, in building up what I, I think we should be very proud of, and that is the uh, infrastructures, the research infrastructures in Europe, especially ESRI, a well-known acronym, uh, the, pa the big pan-European uh, uh, infrastructures, which I would like to say, uh, since I travel quite a lot outside of Europe, I never before realized how envious, there's no other word for it, people in all over the world, in China, India, the United States are, of what Europe has built up, especially from 2002 when S3 was officially established. Now I would like to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves briefly, and then I'll introduce myself as the last person, because I'm only the moderator. So Ulrike, could you say a few words about yourself? So my name is Ulrike Feld. I'm professor for science and technology studies at the University of Vienna. And what this science and technology study does is we look into how scientific and technological developments actually shape our societal developments and vice versa, how our expectations, future imaginaries and everything, how they shape what we do in research and how we can do research. So. I'm trained as a physicist initially with a PhD in theoretical physics, but I moved then in the 80s into the social sciences and my first object of study was actually the European High Energy Physics Lab at CERN where I spent five years. So. I'm John Womersley, I'm also a physicist. Uh, so I've worked at CERN and other large uh, physics laboratories. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, I was the chief executive of STFC, the funding agency in Great Britain for large research infrastructures. And during that time, I was also for two years chair of ESFRI, the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, during the phase when we updated the roadmap and reviewed progress on implementation of a large number of infrastructures that, that were underway. Um, I'm currently uh, the Director General of the European Spallation Source, one of the new wave of big research facilities that's being built uh, following this prioritization of pan-European infrastructures. And I'm Niklas Blomberg. I'm not a physicist, I'm a biologist, but you will count for me, I'm sure. <laughs> so I'm the Director of Elixir, which is a European research infrastructure for biological data. And uh, I came to uh, Elixir via industry. Before that, before I joined uh, the research infrastructure, I used to work as a, in drug discovery for a pharmaceutical company. And so in a way, I think I've followed the data. After my PhD, I went into industry where a lot of high throughput data was uh, looking very interesting. Now I think the big opportunity really is about connecting data and build large cohort between the, the public data sets in our different uh, countries in Europe. Uh, and uh, last but not least, myself. My name is Milena Zitz Fuchs, and I'm a linguist. Uh, I teach at the University of Zagreb in Croatia. However, uh, I got into infrastructures about 15 years ago, quite by chance. And this is a topic that will be coming up in the presentations. I was chair of the Standing Committee for the Humanities at the European Science Foundation for quite a number of years. And one of the big questions that came up, do humanities have infrastructures? So we produced a little booklet that's been uh, uh, the sort of Bible of digital humanities for quite some time now. It was published in 2011. And uh, since then, I got involved with ESRI, John knows this, uh, uh, and it was not just uh, the humanities part, but also uh, all the other uh, uh, domains that are covered, physics, the biomedical sciences, life sciences, etc. And I have to say, it, uh, for me, this was uh, one of the best career moves I've ever made. It opened up unbelievable vistas of 
how to do things, how you can do things in science, data, open data, and we'll be talking about that a little bit. So this session fits in very well with some of the following sessions during today. Uh, that will be, for instance, we have SKA right after this session. Uh, we will also, th there's a session on uh, uh, roadmaps, which are very important in the research infrastructure world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so a lot of, and there's also connection with the question of open data that we had uh, yesterday as a major topic, because infrastructures actually uh, provide, I would say, the backbone of a lot of this cultural revolution that, as it's being called at the seas of, uh, uh, is going on. It is a major part. But let's hear our speakers. Uh, Ulrike, if you could uh, give your presentation, please. <laughs> I would love to have my own presentation. I'm not Niklas Bloomberg. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so, good morning again from my side and congratulations that you made it here and however you feel about this ball game yesterday which I'm not particularly into, but I know that a lot of people are. So what I will try to do in the remaining minutes is to kind of sketch out a framework of how we could look at research infrastructures and understand them. Um, my, this interest is guided by several kind of encounters of my kind. I, I'm a dean of a social science faculty and kind of data infrastructures for social sciences and humanities have become a really big issue over the last years. And they are kind of struggling with the idea that infrastructure, the idea of research infrastructure was actually born very much out of the natural sciences like physics or biology. And I'm also involved in um, the biobank networking. So I do think that's an interesting way to combine these different kinds of, of interests. Now, I would like to start by stating that European research infrastructures should be understood simultaneously as projects of Europe making and of knowledge making. And that has been always the case when you look at the history of infrastructures. They are the places where the scientific slash techno-scientific and the sociopolitical actually meet. And we, uh, therefore, when looking at research infrastructures and their futures, we should remember that we are thinking, we are tinkering with the knowledge foundations of um, the European integration process at one time, and at the same time, the normative political assumptions that go into what it means to do good collaborative scientific work. And I think it's important to remember that when we talk about infrastructures, that it's not only about the technicality of it, but it's also about what they mean. In that sense, I would like to take you very shortly into, uh, into the earlier part of the European history of research infrastructures. And I do think it's quite interesting to point to the fact that CERN, the European High Energy Lab, was founded by 12 European countries in 1954, already three years prior to the signing of the Treaty of Rome that established the Euro European Economic Community and the European Atomic Energy Community. So very often research infrastructures were the kind of forerunners in that sense to other kinds of Europe building. And the creation of the European Space Agency might be a similar example that was four years before the inauguration of the European Parliament. So in a way, we could think of that as a specific form of science diplomacy. And I find that interesting that science diplomacy is very often discussed as going away from Europe somewhere. But I do think it's also interesting to think of it as a Europe-making Europe um, activity. Now, um, I would like to share my idea about what are infrastructures. And I want to use a quote by the US culture and social anthropologist, Brian Larkin, in his article on the politics and the poetics. And I find that quite interesting of infrastructures. And he says, infrastructures are built networks that facilitate the flow of goods, people, and ideas, and allow for their exchange over space. 
So as physical forms, they shape the nature of a network, they shape the speed and the direction of the movement, its temporalities, and I will come back to that, so what are the timelines, how that builds up, and its vulnerability to breakdown. And I think we always have to think about resilience and other kinds of questions when that comes up. But he says something even more important, I think. He says infrastructures also exist as forms separate from their purely technical functioning. They emerge out of and store within them forms of desire and fantasy. It points to this sense of the possibility. And I do think many of the infrastructures we built are not these purely technical animals. They are ways to think about how we collectively can know about the world we live in, about a world that is, has become global over these uh, decades. And I think infrastructures are a very interesting point to look uh, into. Now, that's why I would suggest to think of in research infrastructures together as an ecosystem. And I think using the term ecosystem reminds us that it is about sustainability as much as the, about the knowledge and the infrastructures that support and sustain that knowledge. And in that sense, I, it's also about how we build sustainable infrastructures and ecosystems. So, um, Actually, research infrastructures resist easy classifications. Once you start to look into them, they um, are often unique socio-technical um, entities that were created out of a historic moment and a collusion of people who have um, common interests to do something. They have um, certain kind of epistemological ground rules, I would say, which they share. So they want to do something on the bead on the basis of data, bead on the basis of technologies. Um, we, uh, they define what drives knowledge generation in many ways. So it's important to think how they are put up. They involve different kinds of stakeholders and allow access to different kinds of, of, of actors. And they have a diff varying degree of virtuality. And I do think by all virtuality, don't forget, a good virtuality needs materiality, needs realization through people, and this is not the kind of cost easy thing to do, and I think we will learn today a number of things about that, but it also is tied to specific ethical questions. And I think the, the circulation of data, in particular when it comes to human subjects, and I'm sorry for calling that human subjects, it is a delicate issue, and uh, it is always, be it in the biomedical area, but also being it in the social sciences and humanities. So what do we collect? What do we share? For what purposes? And we have to consider the conditions of emergence because they never totally go away, and we have to build infrastructures that are rigid and strong while they be flexible at the same time. And that is a real challenge. And I just put in this bubble all the different things you could think of. Many of them are by now in the different social sciences and humanities. They are the, the kind of classical um, technology-centered things. But we also have what I would call temporary infrastructures, like we have now flagship projects that are building up for 10 years. And then we have to ask ourselves the questions, where do they go? And what does that mean, etc. So this is a responsibility we have uh, to take. So that brings me to the question why I think they are essential. And I think I gave you here a quite long list why I do think they are essential. Actually, one important thing is they standardize the production of knowledge across sites. And I do think including the kind of ethical issues that come up with that. So they create a, a small universe in which we can talk about what good science means in certain areas. And we could define, and that's a big struggle, define how data are collected over si across sites and things like that. And these are the real big challenges right now in data in intensive sciences to get the good data in the sense of the, the right quality. But it supports also specific forms of collaboration and sharing, and I think we carefully have to kind of look at how open, under all this talk of openness, things are. It's a unique access to certain technologies, data and material. They can ask questions, they're allowed to ask questions unthinkable, just on, in, in each single case or each single lab. They give pl a place to education and skills for the next generation. 
They allow us also to produce sophisticated solutions to technological challenges, be there in the social sciences or in the natural sciences. And of course, they also um, uh, bring about socioeconomic developments. I put that last on purpose because very often that is put first, and I don't think that should be put first. It should be among all the different kinds of things we consider. That brings me to my last point, namely the challenges. This is about European politics if we speak about European infrastructures. But what is the European public? Publics are still very much kind of confined into nation states, and politics is very much thought in terms of nation states. So in a way, these things, what I called multiplicity, they need to be collective and nation-specific always at the same time. They need to be recognizable for people within different cultural contexts. And that is a real challenge for the infrastructures and need to be carefully thought about when building them. They need embedding and materializing of the virtual because people don't see it in the same visuality like CERN is this big thing or we are now this, the palation source or whatever. What cannot be shared? We have to ask that question. So the challenges of health data, the challenges of personal data of people. It's making space and finding common grounds around ethical and social issues. Because by all talk of sharing, we do not necessarily share all of that. And we have to ask whose infrastructures are these? What is the who here in the sense who has access, um, what preferences are made, how they are implemented, argued, etc. And in that sense of an ecosystem, and if we take that notion seriously, we have different temporalities within these infrastructures, and we would have to have a commitment to different, what I call, harvesting models. So to look at the output in different ways, because we cannot expect infrastructures to just deliver a flow of constant things. They need to be built, thought about, carefully crafted, and will kind of deliver over time, sometimes not in the immediate. And finally, I think, even though that's not the nicest thing to speak on a Thursday morning, we need to think about end of life. Is there an end, do we have an end of life strategy? When would we switch off in that sense? Or when do we get a transplantation to the patient or whatever? So that's my first thoughts, and I think you will get a lot from our, our next speakers to fill that up with concrete cases also. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ulrike, for this great introduction, because uh, you've put on the table some of the major issues, not just for infrastructures, but the issues that have been floating around ESOF for the last couple of days, ethics, uh, open data, and all the rest of it. Because as I said before, infrastructures or research infrastructures are not isolated uh, entities that live away from uh, not just researchers, but from life and uh, uh, I'd like to thank you particularly for stressing the, uh, let's call it, social sciences and humanities angle, which is extremely important in all of them. But we go to another world now. John, if you could present the other world with a, a concrete, big uh, infrastructure that is developing as we speak. Thank you, yes. Uh, so I'm gonna give some observations, some thoughts about research infrastructures, drawing on, on what, uh, what Ulrika has suggested, and maybe leading a little bit, I hope, in, into what Nicholas will present. Uh, this is my baby currently. This is the European Spallation Source in Lund in southern Sweden. As you can see, it is a large physical investment in research capability, funded by 13 European countries that have come together to commit resources uh, to build a, a physical infrastructure. But we also have plenty of uh, what you call socio-political challenges as well, creating a new organization on a greenfield site, managing many of the contributions to this project which are coming in kind in, in the form of equipment which is built in other locations and has to be integrated and commissioned and, and operated. And then in managing and stewarding the data from this facility which will be operated in an open science may, way. So uh, we, we all start out um, with, with different ideas about what a research infrastructure is. That, that one that I showed there is a relatively straightforward concept. Um, but really, we're talking about national or international scale investments in research capability 
things that go beyond what any single institution can support and increasingly what any European nation can support with the goal of dramatically increasing our scientific reach. We also hope that this kind of organization will promote collaboration between different scientists, between different scientific disciplines and with industry. And as Ulrika said, the, the motivation is to address scientific questions which require this scale of, of commitment. Climate research, energy research, materials research, health and aging, issues that will not go away, but also economic productivity, the desire, the need to maintain high skills, uh, innovation intensive jobs in a increasingly globalized knowledge based economy. So we often think about science as, as research, sorry, uh, as being divisible um, between, let's say, uh, purer, uh, intrinsically motivated activities, scientists who want to publish or win Nobel Prizes, and more applied work where the profit motive or the desire need to address big scientific uh, challenges. But I think it, it's interesting also to look at this, how it's organized, whether it's bottom-up, led by principal investigators, or large teams, top-down, problem-solving and strategic. And most university research sits in the top left, or most comfortably sits in the top left, and uh, university administrators try to pull it downwards to have greater overlap with industrial work, uh, more applied. But industry is often motivated by large challenges requiring big research teams and major investments at, at the, the billion scale. And research infrastructures are, if you like, that in that top right quadrant in, in this kind of description because they are large collaborative efforts. In some cases like that at CERN, it, it is primarily intrinsically motivated by a desire to understand the universe, whereas climate research is definitely addressing big challenges and things like neutrons and X-ray sources have greater overlap with the, with the applied um, application of, of, of the research. But research infrastructures are, if you like, the a missing part of this, um, this, this phase space because they are the big collaborative um, projects require these big collaborative investments. There are three waves at least of projects like this starting out as, as Ulrika said with things like CERN, National and International Laboratories for High Energy and Nuclear Physics, the first research disciplines which required this scale of collaboration. There is a second wave which, which my project inhabits of user facilities, of big investments that are then used by thousands of individual researchers because they provide a capability that can be exploited. National centers to host machines for material science and structural biology. But there's a third wave which is increasingly uh, important where the research infrastructure is the data set and one is federating networking national centers as nodes of a distributed research infrastructure. And, and we'll hear more about that from Nichols. So to move on to some of the challenges then in this world, this kind of large-scale long-term investment requires strategic thinking. You don't need, let's not, well, let's, let's not be too provocative, you don't need so much of a plan for bottom-up peer-reviewed PI-led research because the priorities can be allowed to emerge from a selection for excellence. But investments in research infrastructures are not like that. There is an opportunity cost. If you invest in one big project, you will have less resources to invest in another. And they compete with other national investments outside of the scientific domain, and they require a long-term commitment if the, if the return on investment is to be realized. So decisions must be made strategically, and they must be made for the long term. And that means there must be some sort of agency able or, or body able to set that priority and then deliver it. And that requires documenting and communicating. And when we talk about research infrastructure roadmaps, we mean that sort of strategy for investment. So you don't need, if, if you go to the grocery store and you're not sure what flavor of pizza to buy, you can buy several flavors of pizza. But if you buy a house, you can only buy one house. And if you bought a house, you can't buy another. And you better be happy with the house that you buy. Research infrastructures are like that. National research infrastructure strategy is not just about every country joining the same set of pan-European projects. It needs to reflect national priorities, and they are not always the same. So later this week, the South Africans will be inaugurating Meerkat, a radio telescope. That reflects geographical capabilities of, of a country in the Southern Hemisphere, but also a research strength in, in that area. There are often industrial strengths if you have a large and strong pharmaceutical uh, uh, 
uh, industry sector, there is a desire to provide uh, <clears throat> Uh, in uh, research infrastructures which can interface with that. Gaps in industry capability may stimulate uh, investment in research just as much as strengths. Priorities and skills needs need to be thought about. Geography, history, colonial history for many European countries drives an interest in tropical medicine, for example, or research stations that address those kind of areas. And politics. Uh, these angry people here who would like jobs I would say that the way to address their concern is by investment in scientific and technical innovation. But they may feel that investment in schools or hospitals might be a higher priority, and they may find an investment in scientific and technical innovation one of the reasons why they are afraid of their future. So we need to think about that as well. Uh, there is a challenge then, having made an investment in a research infrastructure, in sustaining support for it, financial operational support. And sustainability is not a performance metric. It's, it's a, a social compact between the research facility, its users, its managers, and its funders. And a research infrastructure or field has sustainable support when there's a good consensus over its continuing relevance, quality, and value for money. And I would like to emphasize field because, as we just heard, individual infrastructures will reach their peak of scientific productivity and ideally be replaced by something more capable, but the research field itself is the ecosystem that we should be seeking uh, to sustain. And the way to build that consensus, I think, is partly to be able to demonstrate that these research facilities are having the desired impact. The case for initial and ongoing investment depends upon documenting, understanding and then documenting the difference that the research infrastructure has made, scientifically, obviously, but also socioeconomically, the jobs, skills, quality of life that it has, has delivered. And it's useful to think about three different steps along that value chain. The outputs of the research infrastructure, the tangible deliverables, easy to count, easy to measure. The outcomes, which are the things that are impacted by those outputs, the new products or services that may be delivered, those are relatively easy to capture. And then the thing which is really important but very hard to capture is the actual benefits, the changes uh, to society, to the economy uh, that have resulted from that. And those take a long time to be realized, decades perhaps, but so the, the message, the one uh, line message here is we need to start collecting the data, especially on the outputs and outcomes now, so that when the time comes to document the benefits, we have all the, the basis to do so. So that's my three challenges for research infrastructures, and all of them apply both to the single-sided uh, projects like mine and to distributed data-intensive uh, research facilities like uh, Elixir, which we're about to hear from. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John, for giving us a feel for the physical, if I may call it, infrastructures, because there is this basic distinction. And now we go over to Nicholas, who will be presenting what we call the distributed infrastructures, a different breed of animal, if I may say, but very much interrelated with the physical ones as well, although there, there is a link, but you'll hear about it from Nicholas, who knows much more about these things than I do. Nicholas, please. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for inviting me. So in this sort of journey from the general to the particular, I, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the challenges and the organization of distributed research infrastructures. I lead one of these, Elixir, which is focused on life science data. But I think what you, you hear, and, and I'll use examples from Elixir, obviously, because that's what I know best. Uh, but I think there are many similarities, and, and many of the challenges are very much the same for infrastructures in humanities, in the social sciences, and also other life science infrastructures, biobanks, there is a session later today, and, and so on. And, and all of these, I think what we have in common <clears throat> is that we are not building a, a single large facility in the way that ESS and what John just talked about. This is much more about connecting national facilities into a whole. And uh, there are some particular challenges that I'll, I'll pick up on. And, and one of them, I think, is if you look at uh, large-scale infrastructures, so single facilities, uh, they can be, you can be rather hands-off as a university administrator. Uh, you will send your scientists there, and the users will go there for sure, but, but you don't need to be involved. 
Whereas for uh, the distributed infrastructures, our facilities actually are embedded in universities, in research institutes, or, or national sort of um, competence centers. And so it's a much more participatory way of building an organization. And, and that comes with some particular challenges. But John talked about data as the third wave of research infrastructures. I, I, I must say I really like that classification. And, and so this is uh, one example from the life sciences. The, the graph just shows the density of uh, high throughput uh, DNA sequencing machines in Europe. Uh, but I think the, the take home message here, and I think this is true for life sciences, it's also true for other sciences, is that our data uh, production is geographically very distributed. This is not a single instrument that collects a lot of data that you then need to uh, distribute to your community. This is about harvesting data from, uh, I think it's about half a million life scientists in Europe, to harvest that data, make that available for reuse by the whole community. So that, for instance, a, a medical researcher in uh, at the Biobanking Institute in Helsinki would uh, be able to access uh, genomes, say, from breast cancer patients, <coughs> sorry, breast cancer patients sequenced in Barcelona. And so I think that really is a many-to-many -many problem, and, and that's one of the reasons we need to be distributed and federated. In um, biomedical sciences, but I think this is also true for uh, aspects of humanities and social sciences, uh, we need to deal with uh, data from human research participants. And so we need to have uh, security and governance around the data management so that we, we can comply with laws, but more, more importantly, preserve the trust given by these research participants. So they've invested quite a lot of their own personal lives into the hands of the researchers. And that trust, I think, is really important that we manage well as a research community. And, and that brings with it, I think, some uh, particular challenges, or rather the distributed uh, nature is, is possibly one of the solutions. I think the, the last point I, I wish to make here is really on the open da data mandates that's coming through from national and European funders. I, I would argue that's a very good thing, but of course open data does require infrastructure, so we need to help the scientists to make their data available for the larger community. And that comes often as an extra burden on the scientists, and so they will need some support and services to make uh, the open data mandates uh, work. And, and we've worked, for instance, with ERC to put out guidance, so, so guidance sheets for, for scientists and so on. This is an example from Elixir. I think this is typical for many. Um, distributed research infrastructures. Um, the nodes, i.e. our national centers, are funded nationally and often align with, uh, or they do almost always align with the national strength and priorities in the way that John described. I think for uh, something like Elixir, but also many others, that brings uh, a very healthy diversity. So for instance, if we look at Norway, uh, they have a very uh, large uh, national investment in the marine sciences and aquaculture, and understandably our Swiss or Czech colleagues have uh, no interest in these marine sciences at all. And, and so we can actually use that diversity to have leadership in particular areas from the research centers in Europe that are truly leading in that field. I think that the last uh, or the, the, the third point I wish to make here is on the national nodes is that they do provide a framework for long-term resource management, the, the planning and the sustainability that John talked about. It is often very difficult to be sustainable unless you have an institution with a mandate to carry services over a long time. And, and in research institutions, that doesn't always uh, that mandate is not always there. Actually, what we uh, uh, are creating through these national nodes in the various fields with distributed infrastructures are essentially national frameworks that allow important national services to be carried forward and then connected up to similar uh, services in other countries. The, the final point on this slide I, I wish to make, and I think that's uh, again true for many distributed infrastructures, is that the national nodes themselves are distributed. So I, I know the map here with the example from Germany is quite small, but our German node, for instance, consists of, of 39 uh, universities or institutes grouped together in eight different 
centers of various competences, so they have a proteomic center, a human genomic center, and so on, on the national level. And so I think one of the big success stories coming out of S3, and in, uh, I know in Alexa for sure, is that we have triggered a lot of very careful organization at the national level, and I think that's a legacy that will be carried forward over a long time. And I think that also speaks to another important role for distributed research infrastructures, which is that they are, uh, we have a capacity building mandate in perhaps a way that's difficult with a single site, but, but we actually have a role to build capacity in our different member states. So th this is an example just to give a little bit of flavor. Um, this is around uh, how you manage uh, human genomics data. The same would uh, apply for a biobank, for instance, or indeed the social science data set. And uh, what is um, <clears throat> many of these data sets that are based on human, co human research participants and consent will be very difficult to give them a passport. They, they may need to stay in the country, at the hospital or the clinic where they have been collected or within the university. And so uh, we need to find ways of essentially discover that data and make it fair via shared metadata while still keep it in local secure data stores. And I think this is a very nice link to the different uh, cloud investments that are happening. And I know there's a session on the European Open Science Cloud later. The fact that when it will be difficult to essentially uh, aggregate the data into one big hard drive, we need to find a distributed way of providing access for researchers where they can take their tools, their analysis, pipelines and move out to where the data sit and then aggregate results at a higher level to preserve uh, trust and keep the data secure. And this is where I think the research infrastructures in the various fields have a really important role to play. They will provide uh, the standards, they do coordinate the implementation in the way that uh, if standards and technologies are embraced by a research infrastructures, they do give the trust to all of these small local investments that needs to happen for this ecosystem, this federation to work. And uh, as a university dean, you will be, or an institute director, you will be more confident in the local technical investments if you know that the same technologies are being put in place in 600 other institutes across Europe. And I think that's, that's a normative role for this distributed research infrastructure, which is very, very important. The, the other thing that we do is that we manage trust. And so uh, research infrastructures can act as a clearinghouse for access, that you don't need this uh, very entangled web of bilateral agreements, but really can work via a central uh, research infrastructure. The biobanking infrastructure, I think, is a good example with the European-wide ELSI help desk, for instance. But, but essentially, what, what an, a role for them is to, to serve as a neutral broker in this system that can help to sort of contain the complexities. So um, just to, to round this up, I, I wanted to sort of describe the transition uh, that many of these distributed infrastructures go through where you, it's a sort of phase transition from a network to a truly virtual organization that is distributed over Europe. In Alexi, for instance, we have 22 member states. And so through our agreements and these national nodes, we have about 220 institutes involved in Elixir. And so all of these needs to be connected via legal agreement because we need to be able to do things at all of these 200 institutes. And so that, that is a big challenge. We've put that in place. Many other uh, distributed organizations have also started to put this in place. And I think those sort of frameworks for coordinated European-wide actions are real assets for the European research area that we should make uh, really strong use of. I think the other part of a, when you transition out from a network, is that you need to start to set a scientific direction through these national nodes. And so, for instance, in, in Alexa, we run a board with our 22 national node directors where we write our uh, scientific program together. And that is, of course, a, a real challenge to align the sort of joint program with all the different national priorities. So just to end, I think for distributed infrastructures to work, uh, you need to have a joint program. You need to have aligned national funding. And I think this is a similarity with something like ESS, which also relies on in-kind funding. It is about 
aligning a lot of different funding agencies to the same program. You need to put up a legal framework so you can have this coordinated transnational access. That, that I think is the litmus test when you move from a project or a network into a truly virtual organization is when you can act, enact your program via uh, uh, real scientific studies or technical operations. And, and I have to say, uh, my own experience is that these large infrastructure grant consortia that has been funded by the European Commission, where we brought together all the partners, it's not only the investment itself which is important, but actually the experience from all the actors in the system of running these large consortia, I think are really critical to build up these function, uh, functional virtual uh, organizations. So I will end with that and thank you for your attention. I hope there'll be a long list of people for the microphones now. Thank you very much, all three of you. I think that we have, or rather you have, uh, managed to outline from the philosophical, if I may call it, background, what it is. Ulrike gave a fantastic background connecting things that I think many people from the RI world do not think of as being essential. We had an example of a physical uh, RI and the distributed ones, which in a sense, uh, uh, I think, are a preview of what's going to be happening in the future with especially all these topics of open data and open everything. Uh, so uh, this was great. But before I give the floor to questions, I have a question that I that's been bothering me and during these 15 years that I've spent in the RI world, if I may call it, uh, John mentioned the term sustainability, and it's one of the main issues with research infrastructures. And it's not always easy to sort of discern how you're going to sustain a huge investment like ESS, for instance, or something. And on the other hand, even if we simply stick to ESRI, what we have on the agenda are what are called emerging uh, uh, infrastructures, and they're growing in numbers. Some of them are extremely interesting. Uh, I'm particularly enamored with the multidisciplinary ones that are coming around, because I think this is in line with the, uh, let's say, upcoming uh, re you know, difference in research questions, etc., that are appearing. But I would like our three speakers to address this. How do we balance this out, the sustainability issue, and what is, again, a natural phenomena uh, uh, that you get more and more infrastructures appearing. Is there a limit? Because we're talking about enormous uh, uh, sums of money even that are invested now, let alone with the ones that are coming up. Off you go. Okay, um, hmm. <laughs> that's not an easy question, but I, I would answer it in two ways. On the one hand, I do think the way we conceptualize infrastructures should not get too specialized, and sometimes I feel that uh, they become very individualized and tailored to a, a now meet, so a need we see now. And I do think if we think about successful institutions, they have been successful because they manage to transform themselves within their in their life structures. So we need to think about how can we create infrastructures that are a bit more open to different ways of handling things and, and adapting to changing needs. So adaptive infrastructural design is something I think is important. And the second point maybe is that we need to think about what new kinds of labor are needed highly qualified labor is needed in order to make these infrastructures successfully adapt. And I do think in academia we have now researchers and we have, I don't know, technical people, but there is something in between which needs a kind of in-depth understanding of the research, but also kind of having this adaptive knowledge. So we, there is probably also the creation of a new kind of workforce in between which we have not fully embraced yet. Uh, and validated yet within academic systems, for example, to, to educate here. 
so from a, more from a physical infrastructure, well, no, actually, I'll, I'll add a remark from ESFRI as well. So ESS is a big new investment in neutron scattering capability in Europe to look at the structure of molecules and materials. But part of the motivation to make that new investment is that a number of older facilities, mainly research reactors, are reaching the end of their lives. Not just their scientific lives, but their practical operating lives. So there needs to be a transition in this research field from older research infrastructures to new ones. That doesn't require in the long term an increase in funding. It requires a managed transition during which users have to be trained on new techniques and with new capabilities. So I think in while it's difficult, it's manageable because the research community exists and can be persuaded, I think, relatively easily to take advantage of a newer increased capability with some connection with, with the um, decommissioning of older facilities. What we saw in, in ESFRI was that the greatest challenges to sustainability were often in research fields that did not have a history of working with large physical infrastructure. So physics, chemistry, a, 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 astronomy have at least a mindset that facilities come and need to be sustained and operated. But in, in the research fields which are more used to funding of individual PIs for a finite five-year grant, that, that doesn't sustain a, a data infrastructure over many decades. And, and so there's a little bit of, of um, social uh, adjustment in the funders and the researchers to contribute more to longer term projects. Uh, and the, the research funders end up feeling, well, God, an awful lot of our budget is tied up for many decades into the future. And they can, they can often be uncomfortable with this transition more than the individual researchers are. So. Uh, <clears throat> I think there is a third aspect, which uh, and I build on something Ulrike said. So if we, if we look at the US in the 50s after the, the war, there was a whole network of national labs. And uh, actually, they, they all changed research direction. And, and I think it's a way to, if you look at what we have built up through ESFRI, there is a lot of organizational capability that is almost independent of the research content. And I think we can learn a bit from that transition that happened in the US with the national labs, where actually a network of very strong research institutions were filled with a completely new research content over a couple of decades. And, and I think that can be a really important contributor to the long-term sustainability, because building these organizational capabilities I think is quite expensive. I know from my own experience setting up a distributed infra infrastructure that the legal agreements that we have con uh, constituted and, and set up across Europe is of course completely independent of the research content, but that is an asset which is worth moving between research fields. You don't need to recreate all of that every time you want to solve a new scientific problem. This one, it's a bit complicated with the microphones. Uh, thank you very much because you've opened up, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, a whole area of things that should be discussed and that I think that not just SESFRI, but the whole research infrastructure community, because I'm also thinking of the national infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera, will be addressing in the very near future. And now I'd like to open the floor for questions. We have two microphones on the left and on the right. And here we are, people are gathering, great. We'll start from the left, but please, could you introduce yourself and tell us you know, where you come from, which institution, etc. cetera? Uh, thank you, my name's Craig Nicholson. I'm a journalist with Research Europe. Um, my question, I think, is mainly for Nicholas, um, and it's kind of in two parts. So the first part is, how difficult is it to decide which data to fold into a, a federated distributed system? For example, would you consider just leaving out the marine data you mentioned that was only of interest to some people? And then as kind of similar related to that, what's the extra benefit and challenges for Elixir of being folded into something like the European Open Science Cloud? So uh, I'll start with the first one. I think there are two parts to that answer. So I think in the, in, in the biomolecular space, so say um, nucleotide data from genomes and so on, I think there's a fantastic tradition of open data in the life sciences where regardless of field, they have been stored in large archives that, that take specific data types. So DNA data since 
uh, actually early 80s have been systematically collected into large DNA archives and, and they really enable us to do many of the laboratory experiments we do today. It's, in, in, it's inconceivable to do a say a PCR primer without going and looking in these databases and, and they are really an important part of the system. What, what we do and I think that what you're hinting at is so when we start to connect our national nodes there are of course priorities that needs to be set. So which are the projects that we invest in? And uh, I think it is a, a mixture of scientific need and uh, broad interest from our national nodes. And so those are often very healthy debates between the national node directors. But I have to say we often have quite mature debates. So even, say, the, the Czech or the Swiss would acknowledge that there are important scientific problems in the marine sciences and are prepared to take a step back and make sure that that gets invested because they know that there will be other problems that they want to um, promote. But, but of course, you need to have that debate between the countries. Uh, I think, uh, sorry, my near-term memory is probably a bit uh, poor. There was a second part as well. Uh, so it was um, kind of related, but how, what are the challenges and benefits of something like Elixir being folded into the European Open Science Cloud? Is, if you're a marine biologist, is there any benefit to Elixir also having the same portal as the ESS data? So I, uh, so this is possibly a little bit of a controversial view, but my, my view is that the European Open Science Cloud in many ways is the aggregate of all of these domain um, science clouds. And the trick, I think, will be to understand what we can do in common with John and the neutron physics community or the um, earth science community or the social science community and what needs to be done in, within each research community. I, I think it's, it's very difficult to think of a research problem where you need to have a lot of neutron data together with a lot of genomics data. But indeed, there are life scientists visiting neutron facilities to understand crystal structures. If you look at the more technical level, I think there are many components of the technical infrastructure which is completely science agnostic. And there it makes sense to combine because it lowers the total cost of operation. For instance, user access or, or data transfer and storage technologies and so on. So I think that, that will be the trick with the European Open Science Cloud is to understand at which level you need to bring things together and then build an effective supply chain. I don't know, John, if you want to... No, that, that was absolutely the point I was going to make. I, there will be a small number of users who will want to access and combine data from, from biological databases with the physical structure of the object that they looked at. But I think far more we want to have a common set of solutions to the technical problems of cloud access to big data sets. That's part of the ESS data model. We would like not to have to reinvent every protocol, every authentication, every network transfer tool, because there's no, there's no science specificity to any of those things. Okay, uh, the gentleman on the right, please. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Fredex Gar from the OECD Global Science Forum. Um, if I come back to the title of the session, there is no doubt that research infrastructure in Europe have contributed to structuring the European research area. If you take a, a global view, there is no other region in the world where sort of a similar common effort, you know, uh, supported by an increasingly uh, common consensus strategy has led to such a a diversity of research infrastructure which are really open up to a very large user base. However, and surprisingly, the funding for this European research infrastructure is still mostly national, apart from a bit of seed money and, and, and you know, project funding from the European sources. There's no equivalent of ERC for research infrastructure. So, so my question is to the panel is, is the current arrangement, you know, basically having a, a an increasingly European strategy, but still national funding, is hindering the development of research infrastructure? Could it be you know, going faster with a European common pot? Or is the current arrangement with national funding actually uh, satisfactory because having a large pot of money might be too cumbersome uh, administratively you know, to manage, and it's still you know, m more you know, uh, practical to just to do that nationally? Okay, so, uh, now I have to. Okay, I can, I can start. Um, actually, I do think it's quite important to not pull that together because I think the negotiations are the interesting and important part because that makes certain values and certain concerns and certain priorities visible. And I do think 
uh, as long as certain things work in terms of nation states, and Europe is a region where we have different histories and, 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 and forces also in the scientific systems, I find it quite interesting to invest that time to negotiate what we want to build and to think about what the we is in, in, in that is an important part of Europe. And when I speak, for example, about data and human data, I, I do think it's an important place where we negotiate all kind of understandings of trust relationships, of what do we give away, what do we share, has to be over and over renegotiated. And I think it's maybe more efficient in it and apostrophes time-wise to pull that and to pull it out, but maybe it's more stable and sustainable and more robust if it needs to be negotiated. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think the negotiation is an important part as long as it leads somewhere. Um, when, in the case of ESS, for example, having got 13 countries to agree to pool their resources uh, and do something, there's quite a strong commitment then to deliver on that probably a stronger commitment than a single funding agency would, would feel because of the, the, the uh, peer pressure uh, from the, the other participants. But some of the, the problems that have occurred with sustainability of, of infrastructures in the social sciences, the European Social Survey, for example, is because there wasn't really sufficient negotiation and consensus built ahead of time. It was a very ad hoc coming together, which didn't have an institutional framework. So it, it does need to be nailed down. It, it has occurred to me that if you were designing a European research system from scratch, you would probably create some sort of agency responsible for at least coordinating these large investments, but we don't have such a thing and we've made it work. Um, and I know that most of the large countries that are represented on each of our projects would resist uh, giving a large share of their current research budgets to some new agency that they felt they didn't control. So we have to make the current system work. And I think if we're smart, we can use it as a strength and, and not a barrier to decision making. Nicholas? So, so it's slightly different point and, and coming back to the data. I think there is, so there is one big challenge that I think is also in long term a competitive advantage for Europe. And that is that whatever we do, we do need to work across borders. And so if you want to create, say, a large cohort, either from biobanks or from genomic data or from something else in Europe, the social sciences, you will need to work across borders and solve those issues ahead of time. And that looks like a very large complication and a very large investment right now, but I think long term that's going to serve us very well because we have put up a framework for creating these very large data sets that I think other countries that tend to do things internally probably will struggle to, to reach the same level. So that's, but I think there is one area where I see many research infrastructures struggle and where I think it's often difficult to release national funding and that is uh, for the international access of these, so the transnational access of research infrastructures. So for national funding agencies is often difficult to justify in their current schemes why they should open up and fund researchers from other countries to come and visit. I think that visit is a really important part of research excellence and I think that is something that we can look at for collective funding. So. If I may add something, uh, the, and this was mentioned by the commissioner uh, two days ago, and he mentioned structural funds. Uh, and then he said probably most people won't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but I understood because uh, I, I'm a member of the LAMI group. Uh, there's some other people like Mark Ferguson here as well. One of the points that we explicitly stated in the Lamy report is that a part of the structural funds that, in, let's say I come from that part of the world, so I may be, I can be politically incorrect, are misused uh, in a sense, and that a certain percentage of uh, structural funds would be directed towards research, particularly infrastructures. How this is going to work, don't ask me, but I think it's the right step in the right direction because when uh, we wrote up the interim report for infrastructures for the Commission uh, for the first part of Horizon, this was one of the weak spots. Some countries invested uh, money from the structural funds, some didn't. And I am referring to the EU15 group primarily. 
uh, since I come from Croatia, I can say that uh, my country misuses this very extensively. Okay, uh, uh, your turn now. Thank you very much. My name is Henrik Wegener. I'm rector at the University of Copenhagen, uh, involved in quite a few of the infrastructures we're talking about today. But my question relates to the funding and sustainability issue and probably the borders, but I'm more interested in the border between private and public. I was struck by a comment made by NASA that there is no chance that we're going to Mars unless a substantial, probably the major part of the funding for this endeavor comes from private sources. Public funding can simply not sustain such an activity. And, and we also see with our research infrastructures, ESS may be an, an exception, but otherwise every generation becomes incredibly much more expensive than the previous one. So we need additional funding and obviously there is financial resource in the private sector, but how do we engage with that research and, and what are your reflections on how can we develop relations with private industry, uh, private funders, and use that to leverage our activities in terms of building bigger and better research infrastructures in Europe? Nicholas, maybe you should start. We'll go the other way around. Well, I have the microphone. So I, th I think there's two ways of, of looking at that. And, and so one way of extracting funding out of the private sector is taxes. And, and so representing an open data infrastructure, we, um, we see a lot of our investments in the same way as you invest in roads. And so you, it's, a, it's almost a public good, and it's used by the researchers. But we know from our, what we, when we look at the open data, that it's used by educators, it's used in many schools, it is used by many large companies, it's also used by many, many small companies. And so that, that is actually the way that we've approached it, is try to drive an ecosystem of innovation around um, the research infrastructure and the open data, and then uh, work together with them to explain to funders and treasuries the value of that ecosystem, which then helps to sustain the, the research infrastructure investment. I think you can have areas of pri public-private partnership. Uh, I work in life sciences. I, I know the IMI uh, scheme, I think, has worked really well. And, and if you look at that, it's an investment in the order of uh, almost five billion over 10, 15 years from the pharma industry in Europe into academic research. And I think that's perhaps the second point I want to make. When it's very easy to go project specific in public-private partnership, and I think it will be easier to work that up if you take a step back and do schemes like IMI, where you look at injections into the whole ecosystem. It's probably easier both for society, the academic side, and for the private side to build a coherent business case over 10 years in the broad portfolio rather than individual projects. Yeah, so at, at big facilities like uh, X-ray synchrotrons and neutron scattering, uh, we know that there is some small fraction of research which is directly carried out by industrial researchers without open data, with, with privileged access and private IP, and they're willing to pay money for that, but we also know that practically that will cover maybe 10, 5%, 10 if you're very lucky of the operational cost of the facility. But we also know that 20, 30, maybe even 40% of the university-based researchers who come to use these facilities have some sort of collaborative relationship with an industrial partner or students supported by the industry or working with uh, researchers from an industrial background because that's where interesting problems in material science tend to come from. So often the, res the support for the research infrastructure is influenced by the needs of industry and maybe even the, the graduate students who come to do the work and the postdocs are paid, but if the data is going to be made open and the scientific publications are going to be produced in the open literature, the, the industry people will not do their very sensitive close to market research in, in these kind of environments. So we need to respect that. And as, as Nicholas says, it's therefore a public duty to provide that kind of facility. But we are, we are looking to our universities to establish many of those connections because that's, that's a way which seems to work to benefit the industry people as well, who don't have access to students, who don't have access to postdocs uh, themselves. Okay, 
skip all of it. Can you don't, or do you want to skip this? Maybe we have another yes, question. Yes, I think we have to be economical about time. Yes, I'm Martin Andler. I'm a mathematician. Uh, in the discussion, especially the uh, metaphor that John Womersley used, that we choose between uh, a house, I mean, you have to choose using <laughs> buying one house, but with uh, instead of buying one house, you can buy lots of pizzas. And uh, as a mathematician, and probably the argument would be made for lots of scientific uh, fields, uh, we we don't need big research infrastructures, and and so how how can you choose between a house and no. one million pizzas? <laughs> I would go for the pizza, so I give it to him. <laughs> so that that's that's a, probably the best and hardest question we've had because <laughs> because this session is about research infrastructures, which I tried to show a part of a larger ecosystem for research support. Um, you could equally well ask how much money should you put in primary and secondary education compared with universities? And, and I think the government needs to set these priorities. We, we are seeing a bit of a shift uh, where research fields like social sciences and humanities are expecting a bigger investment in these kind of coordinated facilities. And that, that's the most difficult thing to manage is where, where the requirements shift. So in, in most countries, there's kind of an established level of support for research infrastructures. And as long as we remain roughly at that level, it doesn't cause major shifts to the research profile. But in areas where there is a need to support more data intensive, more computer handling, more um, access to infrastructure kind of, kind of work, uh, there's a natural fear then in, in other research fields that that will come at their expense. And I think that's the argument that we need to make, that this is not something that we're advocating at the expense of any other research field, or uh, especially arts and humanities or individual researchers who may feel that any large investment has to come out of an existing pot. We want to grow the size of the pot as, as the demands for data intensive uh, facilities grow. Yeah, that's, that's maybe the idea, but the pot is not really growing, and we all know that at the same time. So I think it is a, it is a really highly political question of how do we distribute and how do we keep enough... Um, if I was using the notion of ecosystem, just think of it literally in a sense like that you need different kinds of plants to grow differently and use, build different resources. So in the long term, we will have to think about how we resource our knowledge systems beyond strategic choices. And I think that is the question right now for many nation states, how to divide these different interests. And I come from a country which, where one minister suddenly had this idea that he would want to get out of service and put the money into biosciences. And uh, he was being told off that he cannot do that. And we kind of moved back in a sense. But it's an interesting, it opened up this question like how, in how many things will we be able to, to, to participate in the party of these, all these things. And I think these will be the big questions also for the social sciences and humanities, where, where infrastructures emerge here and then, because in the beginning they seem to be less cost intensive, but they are and will be. And so I think that will be the important question to discuss with. And to put on the political agenda, how, how diverse do we want to have our system to be? And that's why I found it interesting to have these national debates, because they keep things open and do not close them down too early. Uh, thank you very much. Now, we've got approximately a minute and a half, and I had this great question for the panel members, which I will skip, because I think that we, well, you can relax now, uh, uh, but they know what it is. Uh, but uh, we have two flash posters, and I will ask Ulrike if she could read out the names, if we could have it on the slides, please, uh, of, uh, and please do not leave the uh, auditorium yet, because it's our young colleagues uh, that we would like to support. Now, we don't have the uh, uh, names here, but do we have, uh, yes, it's zero minutes. And, well, the problem is I left my other pair of glasses at the hotel, so. Uh, First, please. Uh, uh, 
post a presenter or flash presenter to come out. I'm sure that you know who you are. Thank you very much. And you can present yourselves because we don't have the slide, okay? Yes, go, go, go up there. Uh -huh, but no Hello, name. everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Anka Nitsulescu from the um, ENS Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris. And I will present you my, uh, my poster. So it's about cloud and cloud computation. Uh, everybody is, we, we all live in a digital area and everybody uses internet nowadays. And I, I'm sure you've heard about the cloud, this movement, which allows us to share our files in a very uh, powerful servers or uh, da data centers to share these uh, files or to access them from anywhere and to process uh, data, so to delegate very heavy computation to powerful servers uh, some, somewhere in the cloud. So uh, all this ca came at a cost because um, without protecting our data, this is uh, just exposed to the cloud. The cloud can access it, processes, uh, it can sell our data to, to some, some other parties, to the government. So we want to have some privacy on, on this data to, um, um, to protect it from some attacks on it and also to be able to, to verify the computation done by uh, the cloud. So for this we will use cryptography which is the perfect tool to ensure uh, free fun uh, functionalities, the privacy of the data, the authenticity of uh, the communication, and the integrity of some computations or of the data. And um, I represent each of them, though the privacy is there in, uh, in our left side. Uh, using encryption schemes and uh, crypto systems, we can um, just protect our data and allow only authorized parties to to um, decrypt it. So a party that has a secret key can access this data and nobody else. But this is not enough to uh, guarantee the origin of the data. So uh, suppose that a sender pretends to be somebody else. So the receiver, even if the receiver is protecting against attacks, he has to, uh, to check the origin of this data. So for this we have authenticity and uh, digital signatures um, which are the equivalent of signatures in the digital area. So um, like that, we are ensured that our data, it's, um, it, it's just uh, ours and uh, no, no receiver, no, no one can sell uh, our identity. So um, this is how we protect our identity on the cloud while sharing data towards other users. And the last thing, and uh, the one, the most important, is the integrity of the data. We want to assure that nobody can modify uh, the data or the co computation is correct as, uh, as the cloud is supposed to do it. So for this, we will attach to the data, to the result of the computation, some proofs that uh, allows us to verify the integrity of this data. And with this, uh, I want to finish my, my speech. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for bringing up these issues because they will be in the future, especially, I think, extremely important. And if I may ask, I can't see the name Ulrike, who's the second presenter? So the second presenter will be Emma Winkles, A Quest for the Origin of Mass, the Higgs boson's interaction with matter. You're welcome to present your slides. Ah, yeah. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for sticking around for just three more minutes. Um, so my name is Emma, I work at the University of Sussex, I'm doing my PhD there. Uh, I work also at CERN, where, where my experiment is, so it was already mentioned before, a very data intensive institution here. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about my research. Um, so CERN is the Particle Physics Laboratory in Geneva. We house the Large Hadron Collider, which collides high energy protons at nearly the speed of light. Um, this allows us to study the elementary particles. So these are really the small, smallest building blocks of the universe. Uh, so we do this to understand how the universe really works. Um, I work on an experiment called ATLAS. Uh, it's one of the four experiments on the uh, Large Hadron Collider ring. 
And one of the main goals of Atlas and CERN was to find the Higgs boson. So you might have heard this buzzword in 2012 when it was found. It was also called the God particle, which is something that we as physicists don't really like this name. Um, but it's good that it got out there. And uh, th this was really only the beginning of uh, this quest to understand the origin of mass, because the Higgs boson was theorized to give mass to the other uh, elementary particles already in the 60s. Um, but so now we found this particle, but there's still many questions left. Uh, the main one being, how does it really interact with matter? So it's really important, it's as important to answer this question as it is to really find the, the particle in, to begin with. Uh, because answering this question is going to uh, make us understand how does it give mass to the other particles. So my specific research is on how the Higgs boson interacts with the top quark. The top quark is the heaviest elementary particle that we know. Um, and since it's the heaviest, uh, uh, it's also predicted to have the strongest interaction with the Higgs of all the elementary particles. Uh, so the process uh, that we are looking for is shown here on this little movie on the bottom of the slide, which I hope I'm not standing in front of. Uh, so basically we collide two protons at um, nearly the speed of light and we can make this uh, Higgs boson in combination with two top quarks. So this is the exact process that we are looking for. Um, so Atlas, the experiment that I work on, we have recently found conclusive evidence that this actually happens the way it was expected. This result came out only last month at a big particle physics conference. So this is all hot off the press. Um, and one of the most interesting results is here shown on the right uh, in this plot, which shows the Higgs boson's mass on the x-axis. Um, so the black data points, the black dots are what the data looks like. So this is what we measure with our detector Atlas. And then the red line shows you what would the data look like if there was the Higgs boson uh, in, formed in this way, shown in this little movie. And the black, uh, or the, the blue dotted line shows what it would look like if there was no Higgs boson. So you can clearly see that the data prefers the one with the Higgs. Um, so this is uh, our, our final result in this ma manner, which is bringing us one little step closer to understanding what the origin of mass is in the universe. Um, so if you want to know something more, I will be at my poster, come during the lunch session or after the other sessions. I'm poster number 69. Thanks. Uh, with these, I would say, um, early career researchers are, 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 are you know, reason for existing in a sense. Thank you very much for your presentations and sort of giving us a preview of what we'll, uh, we can expect within the RI world. And lastly, again, I would like to thank my panelists for excellent contributions and giving, I would say, a very solid context for many of the sessions that will be happening uh, today. Thank you very much.